All right, so first off, apologies for last Thursday. Um, about, I had nothing that earth shattering, but I had one of those mornings where I, about 17 different things went wrong all at the same time with no advance notice and uh, needed to take care of some other things. Um, not that organic chemistry three is not important. Um, it was just not the most important thing on my plate at that very moment. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and cover the, the material from last Thursday, what would have been last Thursday's lecture um, today. And we'll talk a little bit about those that distillation lab. Um, and then I, I, there's one more lab technique that I want to go over um, with you folks. So we will still do another, a different lab today in lab. Um, and it's basically another way of visualizing and using the data from, <clears throat> excuse me, from NMR. Um, so we'll, it'll be, um, you'll have a, a brief lecture and uh, assignment on two-dimensional NMR. So that instead of just having, um, you know, an NMR spectrum that is just shielded versus de-shielded, um, with peaks, you're going to have you're going to have two different axes that are both how shielded something is, and changing what those axes are allows us to do things like figure out how many hydrogens are attached to each carbon fairly directly. Um, once you know some of the techniques for doing that, so we'll go over that. Um, and it and it, it's also what a lot what you sort of start building on in order to do things like biological NMR. NMR of biological molecules is really tricky because there's a huge number of carbons in a biological molecule. Um, and so, and then building from that is what turns eventually turns into MRI. So we'll spend some time in lab today going over some of those techniques to sort of lay, lay the building blocks and sort of explain how um, MRI can work. How, how do you do a NMR essentially of something as complicated as an entire organism um, and actually be able to make any sort of sense of it? Um, <clears throat> but first, we're going to finish talking about alpha carbons. And um, I have not looked at uh, last week's quizzes yet. Mondays, uh, holidays on Mondays are always, they always throw off my schedule for the week. Um, so I'll look at those quizzes and we'll, we'll go, go through your questions from those on Thursday. Um, so this was a leftover one from the other day. What's your favorite organic molecule? Um, this is actually kind of an easy one. Technically, it's your favorite organic molecule too. Uh, technically, dopamine is the only thing that anybody enjoys. Um, so it's everybody's favorite molecule, whether you know it or not. It's the only thing that gives you any sort of feeling of um, reward and accomplishment and the idea that you would want to do something again. Um, so anything you enjoy doing, anything that you like is really a direct result of dopamine. So um, I don't really have a choice in this matter. It's dopamine. All right, so here's a summary of where we left off last Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> if, we, if we try to convert um, an, a ketone or an aldehyde into an enolate, there is essentially two different um, possibilities. So, Remember that the enolate is this, this deprotonated alpha carbon, um, which is also always going to have a um, resonance structure that looks like negative charge on the oxygen and the carbon-carbon double bond. So anytime we're trying to form the enolate, from a carbonyl, 
we can use, we generally just use a, a strong base, but if the base is not strong enough, you just use hydroxide or an alkoxide ion, you wind up with an equilibrium reaction happening where you wind up with both the enolate and the ketone present, which causes problems, right? Because then you could wind up with the ketone reacting with the enolate because you made a pretty good nucleophile and you have a pretty good electrophile, you have a pretty good target for a nucleophile in the carbonyl still floating around. Um, if you wanted to make sure you didn't do that, um, we basically have to make sure that we make, we either use a base that has a very, very, very high pKa. Um, the pKa for LDA is around, is in the 30s. Um, so very, very basic. That's for the LDA. Um, or you use sodium hydride, which makes a gaseous byproduct. So that drives your equilibrium towards the right, towards the product side. Um, because you can't have the reaction happening backwards. You can't have an equilibrium reaction if you don't have that hydride around anymore. So not hydride, the hydrogen. All right. So that that gives you a an irreversible enolate <clears throat> um the other option is if you have a beta diketone if you have two ketones um that are separated by a single carbon so your alpha carbon the active carbon is going to be the one in the middle which makes your beta carbon, um, one carbon further. If you have a beta diketone, then that actually, the enolate is stabilized enough that it's actually really, really easy to deprotonate that alpha carbon. So alpha carbon that's in between the two ketones, right? Because this new product that you make, the enolate here, where you deprotonate it in between the two ketones, has three different resonance structures that have a fair bit of, of uh, resonance stabilization as well. Um, and in that case, you don't need to use a super strong base or sodium, um, sodium hydride. All right, so just... A brief recap of where we left off the other day. And with that in mind, um, let's practice drawing some of these uh, enols and enolates. And I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on this. And then we'll go through these.
Okay, so for these first few, when you've got the beta diketone, the only enolate that you're going to form really is the one that puts the, the negative charge in between the two ketones. That's so much more stable than putting it on either the other two possible alpha carbons. Those alpha car carbons could in theory be deprotonated as well, um, but you're not making something with nearly as much resonance stabilization. And so that's gonna be a lot harder to deprotonate those alpha carbons that I circled in blue. Um, if it's a gamma diketone like B, um, there's not really any resonance stabilization that you're gonna have, right? Those, those ketones, those carbonyls are too far apart to see any sort of resonance stabilization. And all of the carbons are right, the, all of the alpha carbons are identical to each other. There's not one of them that is more stable than any of the others. Um, if we deprotonate it, so and you're going to make the same product no matter which of them you deprotonate. So we just we um, pick one and draw it with the negative charge. Um, for C, we definitely have two distinct alpha carbons, right? Um, one of the alpha carbons is a is part of a benzene ring. The other alpha carbon is a tertiary carbon. Um, if we have to pick which one of these we're going to deprotonate, it's got to be one that has a hydrogen, which in this case makes our decision pretty easy, right? We can't deprotonate that carbon there because there are no hydrogens to remove. That carbon already has four bonds, none of which are hydrogen, so we can't deprotonate that alpha carbon. Technically, just by because it is adjacent to a carbonyl, it is still technically an alpha carbon, but it's not an alpha carbon that's going to react like any of these others that we're seeing. It's not going to make the enolate. And last but not least is acetone. These are sort of our gold standard, our the molecule we use as an example more often than not with these alpha carbon problems. So we've seen this, this enolate formed before. Um, on these problems, you don't need to draw the lone pair that gives your that gives the negative charge, but it can be advantageous to do so to remember that it's still a carbon, it's not a carbon that has extra electrons, it's a carbon that's missing an H plus, right? Which is why some of the, um, a lot of the figures show a lone pair with a negative charge for these enolates, um, because we're still bound by our rules counting to four pairs of electrons, right? We still can't have more than four pairs of electrons. So a carbon with a negative charge means that it's missing another atom, not that it has extra electrons. It just doesn't have as many bonds as normal. Um, let me make sure we answer the rest of this question too. Uh, if we want to draw the resonance structures, most of the resonance structures are going to look pretty similar. Um, they're generally going to be just making a double bond to the carbon as the negative charge and then your oxygen as the extra pair of electrons. And so what's happening there is we're just shifting the electrons over from the negative charge to the oxygen. So a resonance structure for C 
look like that. Uh, resonance structure for B. Would look like that. And for the beta diketones, there are multiple possible resonance structures. Um, so if I redraw first version, you can have that extra pair of electrons move over the left-hand oxygen, which gives you resonance structure that looks like this. Or it could move the other direction. Right. And so that the fact that we get three resonance structures instead of two and two of the three resonance structures still have two conjugated bonds as well gives it um, shows that there's a lot of resonance stabilization. And so that's why they're so easy to form. Let's see. And if we're making these by just treating it with sodium ethoxide, Um, for B and D, we will have both a significant amount of the ketone left with the enolate, right? So B and D don't have any res resonance stabilization of the enolate, and we're not using LDA or sodium hydride. So B and D, you will have a significant amount of the ketone left over with the uh, enolate, but A and C, at least my initial thought is that, uh, no, C probably do, does not have as much resonance stabilization as as we would normally expect, that's an electron withdrawing group on the benzene ring. So C also will have a, will have most of um, a significant amount of the uh, ketone left over as well. My initial thought was that maybe the benzene ring would stabilize that enolate and and cause it to be more stable. But we have an electron. We're going to wind up not being able to to have very much resonance stabilization um from the benzene ring because we have a pi bond conjugated with the benzene ring instead of a lone pair conjugated with the benzene ring which means we're pulling electron density towards our enolate group which is going to make it less stable because we're going to we're we already have a negative charge with that if we look at the resonance structures we could draw with the benzene ring there There's not really a whole lot of ways we can make we can draw a resonance structure that involves the benzene ring that's going to make this more stable because we can't push more electrons towards the benzene ring. So if we could spread the negative charge out more, we could make that more stable. But we can't really draw a resonance structure that puts a negative charge in the benzene ring because of the position of that pi bond. And if we tried to draw a resonance structure, the only resonance structures that we can draw are going to be pulling electron density away from the benzene ring. So we could do something like this. 
that's going to have a positive charge there and make a pi bond here. But you see how all, all that really did was make more charges when we did that. So technically that's a valid resonance structure, but it's not going to be a very significant one because we don't have any, um, we made something that's a lot less stable than what we started with. There's not really a way we can start from the molecule drawn in red, the resonance structure drawn in red, and move any of the charges, any move that negative charge into the benzene ring. All right, so despite the fact it looked like maybe we, would, we were gonna have some more, another um, molecule that could, would, we could make the enolate with just sodium ethoxide, A is the only one here that was going to be only the enolate present at equilibrium. Um, if we want to talk about whether these ketones, these alpha carbons are more acidic, that's just another way of framing which one of these is going to be most stable as the enolate. So similar to what we were just talking about, the most acidic compound is the one that's going to have the enolate most stabilized through resonance. So um, if we have 2,4-dimethyl-3,5-heptane-dione. So 2,4-dimethyl-3,5-heptane-dione. Or If we want to choose which of these is going to be more, more acidic, what do we need to consider? The alpha position between the two ketones, whether, I mean, that, that would be the most stable position if there's a proton available. Oh, wow. Right. That's where we want to deprotonate. So the molecule in red, the 4,4-dimethyl, doesn't have a hydrogen there. So it can't really be acidic in that position. The 2,4-dimethyl, on the other hand, um, has a hydrogen in that alpha carbon in between the two ketones. So by a long shot, this will be far more acidic. The pKa for that proton be, I want to say it's about five pH units lower. Makes it 10 to the five times easier to deprotonate. One, two cyclopentane dione or one three there's one two cyclopentane dione there's one three so same thing here if it's we need it to be a beta diketone in order for to get that really stable alpha carbon. So the 1,3 cyclopentane dione would be far more, <laughs> excuse me, 
still fighting a bit of a cough. <clears throat> turns off, turns out giving your immune system a break for 15 months means the first time you get the flu after, after a pandemic, it feels like uh, it's, it's not pleasant. I mean, it's overreacting, I would say. All right. Last choice, acetophenone or benzaldehyde? So acetophenone I'm going from memory here. I believe that's acetophenone, but we can check on mold view real quick. Yeah. So acetophenone or benzaldehyde. This one's a little bit interesting, right? Because we do have a hydrogen that could be removed from the benzaldehyde, even if it's not on an alpha carbon. But typically we don't think of aldehydes as being super acidic, right? And you're not gonna have too much in the way of resonance stabilization. So the fact that the benzaldehyde does not have an alpha carbon that you can deprotonate, if you did deprotonate the benzaldehyde, you're gonna wind up with this molecule, which interestingly enough is actually can be resonance stabilized more than, than the enolate formed over here because you wind up with a lone pair that's directly conjugated with the, with the um, benzene ring, um, but you don't wind up making an enolate. So I believe this is, this is definitely the one we would expect to be the most stable um, because it does have an alpha carbon. The benzaldehyde, however, is a bit of a special case. So just in the interest of double checking that, um, whether or not the additional resonance stabilization of having that, that negative charge next to the pi bond. Um, let's, let's look up their pKa values. So we check chemical and physical properties, and we don't usually want any computed properties at this point. Um, if you scroll down, your first things you'll see will be usually be physical descriptions, including what color is it, what does it smell like, boiling point, melting point, flash point, solubility. Uh, log P is not pKa. Um, log P actually has to do with um, how soluble it is in various solvents. And when in doubt, when you can't find something here, we go to good old Wikipedia. 
And if it's on Wikipedia, it'll be over on here on the right hand side. Usually, uh, they do not have it on here either. Well, I'll have to check the answer key to double check to double check this, but we can expect that acetophenone should be more acidic than the benzaldehyde. You can tell neither of them is that acidic under normal conditions because we can't find a pKa for it. If it was something that we expect to see um, in its deprotonated state under normal conditions, we would we should be able to find a pKa pretty easily. All right, so let's talk about um, one of the primary reactions that we see um, for these alpha carbons. If we have acid catalyzed conditions and a halogen, excuse me. Um, we, we actually can wind up halogenating at the alpha carbon position and getting okay yields as well, about 65% yield. Um, and so the, and it kind of follows some existing mechanisms we know, um, enol formation and then halogenation. So why don't you give that a try, try and draw a mechanism for this that could account for how we see the production forming here. So start by drawing your enol and then try to remember how halogenation works. All right, so first things first, we want to draw this mechanism. We want to draw the enolate forming or the enol forming first. If we're drawing an enolate, 
um, we just need a base and, and it's a straightforward proton transfer to make the enol eight. Um, if we're, and if we're under basic conditions, forming the enol is, is effectively the same thing um, where once we get to, once we deprotonate and see that elimination reaction, we have a resonance structure. Um, brom the bromide could be the base. Typically, we would we would want to see a stronger base in that sodium ethoxide or sodium hydroxide or LDA. Um, so if it's if we're under basic conditions, if it does, and actually we are not under basic conditions, right? Um, because this was the, we started this by saying this was acid catalyzed. So I started in the wrong spot here. So let me clear this up. So before we can deprotonate, we need to protonate because we can't make anything with a negative charge. So if we're in acid catalyzed conditions, we're not going to make the enol eight. We're just making the enol. So that's going to look like, so in this case, um, if we have H3O plus floating around, then we're going to wind up with the lone pair here, grabbing the H plus, making water. So we wind up making an intermediate that looks like this. Um, we can use the bromide as the base down the road to accept a proton for one of these other proton transfer steps necessary. Um, but we would not we would not see it um, actually deprotonating uh, or doing the the elimination step to make an enolate. Um, so once we make this, then we then we have um, we can wind up doing the elimination portion here, and we could either use water or bromide. Um, although we're we're starting from bromine as Br two, so probably water is a is your best option, but realistically, you're going to have some bromide floating around at, as soon as this reaction starts. And so anything could be used as the base there. and make sure we draw our arrows the right way. My initial arrow had the pi bond moving towards the other carbon, but that other carbon already has four pairs of electrons, right? And a proton transfer step, we're not moving any electrons away from that carbon. So the pi bond is moving towards the oxygen, not towards the other carbon. And you wind up with the electrons that were part of the carbon hydrogen bond moving over to make our new enol pi bond. So that gives us the enol. And that, so those are the first two steps of the mechanism. You make the enol, then we just have to figure out how we get from the enol to having a bromine here. And that's just gonna look like a, a um, addition reaction. One of the first addition reactions that we learned was um, you can wind up with bromine being added here um, to one side or the other. So if we, let me clear the whiteboard here. 
So there was our enol formation that we went through. They showed it the resonance structure um, in two different steps. So we still had our second step after we protonated um, the carbonyl. I drew three red um, electron pairs moving at the same time. They have the, all, the same three steps just drawn um, more, more blown up. Um, either one of those ways would be a valid way to show this. This, the halogenation part is what's gonna look just a little bit different is um, from a regular addition reaction. If it's a regular addition reaction, we wind up making that three-sided ring structure where we wind up with bromine being attached to one of them with a positive charge. Um, but the fact that we have a, an oxygen attached to our alkene, the fact that it's an enol instead of just an alkene means that the, the mechanism for the halogenation just looks a little bit different because we can have make this um, extra stabilization step by remaking that carbon oxygen pi bond, right? So just a, a recap of where if it was just an alkene, reacting with Br2, we wound up with bromine leaves, you wind up with this being attacked here, and you wind up making that intermediate that looked like Uh, that three-sided ring structure. Does that look familiar from, from alkenes? I know it's been a long time. Um, and then we would, and then we had bromide still floating around, which would come in and attack to the other side. So this was for um, when we halogenated alkenes, we wound up adding a bromine to each side. We broke the pi bond and we put a bromine on each side because we wound up making this unstable intermediate which could then be attacked again by our bromide <clears throat> the difference in this mechanism is that we don't make that three-sided ring structure we have the same basic steps here your pi bond attacks one of the bromines the other bromine leaves with the extra electrons to make bromide the difference is that oxygen that has the pi bonds there. So instead of making that three-sided ring structure, you remake the carbonyl group. And remaking the carbonyl group is more stable, even though it puts a positive charge on the oxygen, than making that three-sided ring structure. So you don't actually still have something that bromide could act as a nucleophile and come in and attack again. Because remember, bromide is not a great nucleophile. So bromine is not strong, br sorry, bromide is not strong enough to be able to come in and attack that carbonyl carbon the same way that it could break up that three-sided ring structure. Right, and so the, the net result is that we wind up only adding one of our bromines and only in the alpha carbon position. So before we take a break, Let's consider this. If the alpha carbons are asymmetric, bromination will, will occur preferentially at the more substituted carbon. Why might that be the case? The same thing as the Zaitsev Hoffman rule? Yeah. Stability. I like that answer, Elke. Always a good catch-all when we're not sure. Yeah, um, 
specifically, I can't think of if it was, if we called it Zaitsev, again, going back to alkene stability was a long time ago. Um, yes, the Zaitsev rule says that you will preferential, if you're going through an elimination reaction, you'll make the more substituted alkene. More substituted alkenes are more stable. So if we look at the two possible um, enols that we could make here, we could make the tri-substituted enol or we could make the dye substituted enol. That one's more stable. So this is the enol that we're making as our intermediate. That's the, that's the structure that we're going to wind up brominating. We will see less of this one. Right, so like, like Elke mentioned, it always comes down to stability, right? In this case, it's the stability of an alkene. There's also, we've also used stability of the carbocation intermediate to decide which product to make. Um, we're going to see that stability of a carbanion winds up playing a role in some reactions as well. Um, if we wind up making the enolate instead of the enol, we're looking more at where would we put a negative charge to make it more stable. It turns out carbanions follow the exact opposite rules as carbocations. For carbocations, they're more stable the more substituted they are, but for car carbanions, they're more stable the less substituted they are. So we can actually control which of these reactions we do. Um, if we are going through an enol, versus an enolate is gonna control which set of stability rules we need to pay attention to because we're going through a different intermediate. All right, let's take our break. Let's take 10 minutes um, and come back at nine o'clock and we will talk about that Excel lab.
All right. Just want to come on back. Let's talk a little bit about that. The last pieces of that um, uh, Excel assignment. Get getting the assignment pulled up right now. All right, so if I'm remembering where everybody is properly, I believe that for the most part, we were able to um, we were able to get at least the first distillation um, modeled and. and left it sort of looking about like this. We were able to get the delta H of vaporization for ethanol and for water, and same for the delta S. Um, and we used that to um, predict what the vapor pressure of ethanol and water were at, at a um, specific temperature. So. When we put those together, we wound up with something that looks like like this, and then we we use the mole fraction, the starting mole fraction of the various components, to predict what the total vapor pressure was of what ethanol and water. So the mole fraction of each of them um, on this particular sheet, I did uh, all my calculations in Excel. So getting the mole fraction of each of them um, is down here. And I believe that based on your starting conditions, you should have wound up with a mole fraction of about 5% ethanol and 95% water. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, and then figuring out what the boiling point was going to be, was just a matter of figuring out where your total vapor pressure was equal to atmospheric pressure. So for one atmosphere of pressure, that just meant we were going down here and scrolling down till we got to the point where our total pressure was equal to one atmosphere. So somewhere between 371 and 372. Um, and then that allowed us to then say, okay, well, our partial pressure of after distillation one, the vapor pressure of ethanol was 0.65 atmospheres, roughly. Um, and that that does not look right because our Sorry, that's left over from a different um, calculation because we should be sitting here at between 371 and 372. The vapor pressure for each of them though was just going to be that particular vapor pressure at that temperature times the mole fraction of the liquid. All right, and so that gave us a mole fraction of vapor because we could then say if we know the mole fraction of ethanol in the liquid was 0 0.05 and the vapor pressure of ethanol at that boiling point was something like two, 2.05. That's if it was pure ethanol at that temperature. We can 
use this relationship to uh, these two numbers say, okay, our actual vapor pressure above the liquid in the um, distillation of the ethanol is going to be our mole fraction of the liquid times the vapor pressure of the pure material at that temperature, right? So once we get the vapor pressure of, F or how much ethanol we have in the vapor phase, we'll do the same thing for water. That's, we can then take those two numbers to figure out the vapor or the mole fraction of ethanol in the vapor phase. This was our mole fraction of ethanol in the liquid phase that we were boiling. In the vapor phase, it's going to be different. Um, and if you do that, There it is, that's the one, 371.7. So then our, our vapor pressure of ethanol was 0.1 atmospheres and vapor pressure of water was 0.899 atmospheres. So therefore the mole fraction of ethanol in the vapor phase would be 0.1058. We can then turn that into the alcohol by volume by undoing the same calculations we did before. We took alcohol by volume and turned it into mole fraction, that means we can also take mole fraction, turn it back into ABV. Um, and that we actually wind up seeing that our alcohol by volume went up significantly, about doubled. So for distillation number two, <clears throat> and if I'm remembering correctly, I think everybody got to, was at least headed in this direction. You got to the point where you could model um, the vapor pressures as a function of temperature and the total pressure um, and find the boiling point. To do this, if we want to do a second distillation, all we're really doing is we're taking the results of distillation one and making that our starting point. So it's going to be the same. In fact, look, if you look here at uh, distillation one versus distillation two, the vapor pressure of the pure solvents is the same for distillation one versus distillation two. The only thing that's different is that we're starting with a different mole fraction. Instead of starting with 0.05 mole fraction of ethanol, we're starting with this mole fraction of ethanol. So that's going to affect this third column, our total vapor pressure, because our total vapor pressure was based on mole fraction in the liquid. We're just starting with a different mole fraction in the liquid. And that's going to affect your total vapor pressure. And so you should get to a the boiling point. If I scroll down to where we hit one, it's between 369 and 370 now. Instead of being between 370, one and 372, it's between 369 and 370, which means that's going to change our mole fraction in the vapor phase again. So doing successive distillations is the exact same calculation, just starting from a different mole fraction in your liquid phase. Um, and so then I had my, my spreadsheet set up with a summary over on the right-hand side that had, where I just pulled out the numbers I had calculated, mole fraction of ethanol in the liquid phase, the boiling point, mole fraction of ethanol in the vapor phase, and the alcohol by volume of the vapor phase. Um, and so this is all just repeating the same thing that we did for distillation one. Find where the, boil, where the total vapor pressure hits one atmosphere figure out what the mole fraction of eth ethanol is in the vapor phase above that. Turn that into alcohol by volume. Um, and 
if we did something like changing the um, atmospheric pressure. So that's how we'd answer things like, um, that gets, gets you through four and five. If we wanted to do a distillation at 0 0.05 atmospheres instead of point instead of one atmosphere, then the only thing that's different and once again, these numbers cancel. Um, these numbers are are going to be the same because the mole fraction or the vapor pressure of ethanol of pure ethanol at Temp any given temperature is not going to change. Or if we wanted to, to find how a distillation at a lower atmospheric pressure would work, all that's really changing is the boiling point. The process is the same, except now instead of scrolling down until we hit one atmosphere, we scroll down until we hit 0.05 atmospheres. So go down which should be a much lower temperature, about 303 Kelvin. In other words, just above room temperature. But then the rest of the process is the same. Figure out what your mole fraction is of the vapor above that. Then use that as your starting point for your second distillation. Take the mole fraction of the vapor from distillation one and that's going to feed in and be your mole fraction of the liquid for distillation too. Right. And if you do these right, you should wind up with a pretty significant difference. So for instance, starting from the exact same point, if you do the distillation at 0.05 atmospheres, in one step, you go from 0.05 to 0.1 to 0.12 mole fraction. And after three distillations, you wind up at 73% alcohol by volume instead of when it was one atmosphere, you got 65%. You can actually get much better distillation if you do distillation under a vacuum. Um, and so you're answering these questions should be a very, it should get fairly repetitive and you, sh you need to prep to try and be very, very um, meticulous with keeping track of what number is what, label everything, because it's really easy to mix up, okay, was that mole fraction of the vapor or the liquid? And is that after distillation one or after distillation two? Um, you need to keep track of all your numbers, but you're just building, you're using your results from distillation one to feed into distillation two. And then you're using your results from distillation two to feed into distillation three. All right, so if you, if you can get to this, which I think we all got there, you have all the tools needed to keep going. It's just, you have to keep going it, and keep, and just repeat it, all right? So uh, in order to let you guys get caught up on this and finish this up so that you don't have two outstanding labs at the same time, I'm going to give you the rest of today's lecture to finish working on this, and I'll stay on with you to answer questions as you're working through this. Um, but let's get this turned in as soon as we can, hopefully before lab today. And then in lab today, we're going to introduce a new technique as well. And we can also um, use the time to finish up on any of these, any of this that um, you're still. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Elkie. Um, we can absolutely, so when I say use the solver, there is a command in Excel that says, um, 
that is uh, using a solver. Um, if I wanted to, let me stop a screen share for a second. Um, if we want to look at, there it is. How do we actually take these? Actually, I take it back. I'm going to go back to screen share. I'm just going to use. Um, let me pull up words. Uh, equation editor. For the sake of filling this in. And. All right, so if we want to solve. The boiling point for the boiling point at one atmosphere, we're going to use equation six. The problem is, is that that winds up, we're, we're trying to solve for T in this thing, in this big mess. Because if we know everything except for the boiling point, the boiling point's the temperature, right? It's the temperature where this complete equation is equal to one atmosphere. So you need to know delta H for both of our components. You need to know delta S for both of our components. R is a constant. We need to know mole fraction in the liquid for both of our components as well. All right, so getting to um, mole fraction from alcohol by volume was a bit tricky or it's it's definitely not something we've had to deal with for a while if we know it's 15 percent alcohol by volume then we can say okay 15 percent alcohol by volume let's assume we have 100 milliliters we have 100 milliliters of mixture And that means for every 100 milliliters of mixture, we have 15 milliliters of ethanol. And if we know the density of ethanol, and I happen to have that off the top of my head close, relatively close, only because ethanol happens to be, ethanol is kind of unique in that its boiling point in Celsius at N1 atmosphere is actually real, is the same numbers as its um, density in grams per milliliter. Um, it's 0.79 grams per milliliter, and it's also um, boils at 79 Celsius at, at sea level. Um, so, but that's going to, using that density will allow us to convert to grams of ethanol in 100 milliliters. And then we can use the molecular weight of ethanol, which I think is 46. Forty-six point one. And that'll give us moles of ethanol. And we do the same thing with water and the, using the density of water and the molecular weight of water to get the moles of water. So we'll get 15 times 0.79 over 46.1. Then we do the same thing for water, except it's going to be 
85 milliliters of water. And for every one milliliter of water is 1.0 grams of water. Use molecular weight of water, one mole. Eighteen point oh two ish. We get 4.7 moles of water. We take 0.257 divided by 4.72 plus point. So remember mole fraction. for this part, I'll just do it by stylus. Mole fraction of ethanol is always just going to be moles of ethanol over moles total, which in this case is moles of ethanol plus moles of water. So 0 0.257 moles of ethanol over 4.72 plus 0 0.257. And remember, this is in the liquid that we're starting with. We get 0.0516, right? So once we get that, and I think that I think um, that's a, like I said, a, a fair bit of review that you haven't had to think about in a while now. But for distillation one, this is now a constant. We know that we're just going to treat the mole fraction of the ethanol in liquid as a constant, 0 0.0516. And once we get that, And we can actually then do the same thing for the water or just do one minus. A number there that gets a small fraction of ethanol. So to plug it into the equation that we actually need to solve for the boiling point, we're going to be plugging in one atmosphere here. If we say A is our ethanol, we're plugging in a mole fraction in the liquid of the ethanol in here. And delta H of vaporization for the ethanol here, delta S vaporization here. R is a constant. And then we're going to use, if B is the water, we use the mole fraction of water delta H vaporization of the water, delta S of vaporization of the water in the second section here. But this winds up being something that um, 
no matter how good you are at algebra, this is a really, really hard thing to solve the temperature. That's what we want. We want to set pressure, atmospheric pressure equal to one and solve for temperature, which is really hard to do. Um, and so that's why I recommend using a solver. I would get it set up to the point where you can, um, where you can just type it in. So plug in your, your numbers here, we're gonna say, One point zero zero. That's our atmospheric pressure equals mole fraction of ethanol. So zero point zero five one six times e to the negative delta H vaporization. And so since I have that, I have that. Over your delta H vaporization for ethanol was 39,694, according to my spreadsheet. So assuming that we did that right before. Over, and we have R in, in uh, energy units, because that was in kilojoules per mole. So we need R is 8.3145 times T. Then we had that plus, where did our equation go? Plus S, plus delta S over R. Delta S for ethanol was 112.9 over 8.3145. That's the first half of the equation. We do, the, do all of the same things with all of our numbers for water instead of ethanol and leave the T in there. And so the, all we're doing is we're plugging in all of these numbers so that we can then turn around and type it into Wolfram Alpha. Do the substitution first here. You could even simplify some of the numbers if you wanted um, for the sake of making it easier to type into Wolfram Alpha. And then, so then we had, um, I actually don't know Symbol Lab. I, I know how to make Wolfram Alpha and Excel jump through hoops, but I don't know Symbol Lab. Um, so if you are more comfortable using Symbol Lab to as a solver, by all means. Um, in fact, we could try it and I'll work through it with you. Once we get this typed up, it shouldn't matter what solver we type it into. We should we just want to tell it to solve for T. Um, so our mole fraction of the water 0 0.9484 and i know that this seems like i'm going slow um i'm not just babying you and going slow here this is because this is the way i would do it i wouldn't be typing it i'd be doing it on a piece of paper um but get all of your substitutions in first before you try and type something this complicated into a solver um they're just way too many places to mess up if you try to <laughs> <clears throat> type it into a solver before doing these substitutions. Negative delta H of water is 41421 over 8.3145 times T. Delta S for the water is 110. 0.9 over 
So this is the equation that we're actually trying to solve for. We want to solve for t here. And um, let's see, can you just use symbol lab? So if we're trying to enter this into symbol lab, you want to make sure you're using all the right formatting. one equals 0 0.0516 times. Um, and generally the shorthand for using e to a power is just exp, open parentheses. Negative three, nine, six, nine, four over parentheses 8.314. times T, close parentheses, plus 112.9 over 8.3145. Okay, so that looks like what we have written. That makes sense. Everything's in the right place. Do the same for our other half, 9484 times EXP negative 41421 over and i don't know if symbol lab does other variables. So if you're unsure, you can always just use X instead of T there. All that really matters is we only have a single variable in there. And if we don't want steps, yes, this is one where it doesn't give you the decimal equivalent here. If you open it up as a PDF, it might give you that option. Yeah, so it still doesn't give you the option there. Um, and there's, there's likely to be more than one solution because this is a complex function. This would be one place where I would suggest using Wolfram Alpha because Wolfram Alpha has a nice button that says show approximate form. So if I just retype all of that in, and I may be able to copy and paste it. Let's see. We'll be able to see if it interprets it properly. Um, this, the way you copy and paste it, what you get from Symbol Lab is, uh, is a format called um, LaTeX that is very useful for um, writing equations. And that does look all right. And we do get solution over the reals. So this is actually new. Um, that traditionally what Wolfram Alpha would have done was give you all of the solutions, including the, the non, the imaginary solutions that involve I, but it looks like they have it set up at this point 
um, to only give the approximate solution over the real values. So 371.8 would be how we, um, when we solve for X, X is, <clears throat> we're gonna hit the um, boiling point at 371.8. And if we double check that, that should be where we see 371 point, between 371.2 and 372.2 is where we see it hits boiling or it hits one atmosphere of pressure. And if we just want, if we find the, define the boiling point for the same liquid mixture, but at a different pressure, we would just, instead of plugging in one here, we plug in 0.05, Give it a second to think because this is tricky math, even for Wolfram. We get 303.592. All right, and any of these that are changing, if we want to find the boiling point, if it's not that mole fraction, all we really are changing between distillations one and two is um, the mole fraction of our starting material. So that 0.0516 is different and the 0.9484 is different. But the math is the same and our delta H and our delta S values are not changing. So all we really would be changing are these mole fractions in front or the atmospheric pressure on the left-hand side of the equation. Right, any other specific questions about how we would go about doing any of these? I'm just having trouble going back to alcohol by volume from the mole fraction. Okay, let's do that. Um, so for any, um, for any time we have a, concentration that we want to that we want to change into different concentration units start by just assuming an amount and so if we say okay i've got one mole of molecules if we have so let's say we what did you wind up with as your mole fraction of ethanol for the for which distillation which one, whichever one you're working on. Uh, I haven't been able to figure out the alcohol by volume for any, but let's say the first one was 0 0.106 for the vapor. Okay, so that that is just like a percentage, right? Except it's a percentage by mole instead of a percentage by volume. So if we do something similar, we say, okay, let's say we have one mole of mixture and for every one mole of mix I have 0 0.106 moles of ethanol from there you can say okay well you basically are going to use the molecular weight to get to grams and then the grams to get to a volume so base just the opposite of what we started doing because we so then we can say okay well one mole of ethanol is 46.1 grams of ethanol and for every 0.79 grams is one mole is one milliliter And that allows us to get to milliliters of alcohol. So if we had one mole of molecules of everything put together, this is how many milliliters of ethanol would be in there. And we can do the same thing with water. One mole of the mix for every one mole of the mixture, it's going to be. 0. Is that 
9-4. Yep. Moles of H2O. And if we just use a density of one gram milliliter, so we're still not all the way done at this point, but that gets you to how many milliliters of each of them you have. So now to get alcohol by volume, you're gonna take milliliters of alcohol, divide by milliliters total. So when I'm looking at this, I get 0.106 times 46.01 over 0.79. I get 6.17 mils of ethanol and 16.12 milliliters of water. once we get there, getting to alcohol by volume is just taking a percentage, right? Yeah, so you divide the milliliters of ethanol by the total volume, and then that gives you percentage? Or Technically, to make it a percentage, you'd want to multiply by 100, but yeah. So... I get 27.7%. Yeah, I got 28. Thank you. I don't know why I was getting totally stuck on that. I think maybe I couldn't think of the idea to start with a random amount and then break it down from there. But yeah, thanks. It's, it's a little bit counterintuitive for what we're used to. We're not used to assume one mole of a mixture because Typically, if we're talking about moles, we're talking about specific compounds. The idea of starting from a mole of a mixture seems a little bit wrong. It um, seemed appropriate to assume a certain volume when you're trying to figure out alcohol by volume going the opposite direction, though. Right, because we're used to dealing with milliliters of mixtures. We're not used to dealing with moles of mixtures. Uh, so, but same, same basic principle, though. It's, we're just still assuming a starting amount. It's just starting assuming a starting amount of molecules instead of a certain amount of volume. So. Um, and I did a lot of this math on paper and it's pretty sloppy. Do you want me to like take pictures of it and include it or try to plug it in Excel or? Um, <clears throat> the reason, the reason why I find it to be really helpful <clears throat> to do it in Excel is because it allows you to change it. If I wanted to start, if I had my, my sheet that I went to the trouble of doing all this in Excel at one atmosphere, and then I went through and I wanted to change to doing it 0.05 atmospheres, all I would have to do would, would be to make a copy of this whole sheet 
And then instead of, and then I could go through and I'd be solving for a different point here. And that's gonna allow me to plug in different numbers for distillation two and distillation three. And everything changes and cascades through and it just makes the second step of that much easier. Um, but if you're doing it on paper, you feel free to do it on, on paper to set up all your math and just use Excel to do your, your total vapor pressures and things like that. Um, and yeah, just to include a, you know, a PDF of your or a screenshot of your work um, on paper is, is totally fine. Um, I've, I've just always tried to be in the habit of, I guess not always tried to, um, in your shoes at this point, at your point in my career, I would have probably done the same thing, done it on paper and then plugged it into Excel by hand. Um, I just got lazy in grad school in upper division and I didn't always have scratch paper around, um, but Excel, I always had Excel around. Well, it seems like it's a more um, so, efficient way to do it with Excel. I just didn't have enough confidence that I was doing it right. I was like, I don't know. Let me play around with this on paper, see if this makes any sense. Yeah, and that's, and that's totally fine. Um, especially, you can also just use, use that to boost your confidence because if you do it on paper and get one answer and then you plug it into Excel and get the same answer, you know that you did your calculations, right? Right. So you can always just check your answers using Excel and you should get the same numbers. So it's it's not a bad way to go about things to make sure. And just make sure you're doing your reasonableness check too. Do I get a number that makes sense? If you wind up with an alcohol by volume that's more than 100%, you probably screwed something up somewhere. Um, and it might, it's probably as simple as missing a decimal point in a lot of cases. But um, yeah, definitely double checking that's not a bad idea cool man thanks for the help with that no worries anybody else have anything in particular they want to go over all right then with that we're actually right about at time i do have office hours at 10 30 um if you wanted if you run into any more issues 10 30 to let me double check I think it's 10.30 to noon. Yeah, office hours, 10.30 to noon. Um, if you do have any issues finishing this up, otherwise, everybody have a good morning and I'll see you at one o'clock.